Well, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everyone, depending where you are. Welcome to today's uh, Future of Financial Information webinar. My name is Michał Dzielinski, and I have the pleasure to host this series. And uh, today with me are Russell Jane from the University of Kentucky and uh, Greg Eaton from Oklahoma State University. And so the topic is Wall Street Bets. So something uh, probably few of us were aware of like a year ago, but uh, quite a few more of us are aware of it now after what happened to GameStop and, uh, and, and similar stocks. Uh, so, but turns, as it turns out, you know, Wall Street Bets is not all apes and memes. There's, uh, there's more to it than that. And uh, it's potentially a source of information. And that's what makes it a very good uh, fit for this uh, series. And uh, that's why uh, we're very happy to have uh, Russell uh, today presenting this paper. Uh, so just uh, some housekeeping. Uh, Russell's presentation will be about 30 minutes. After that, we'll hand over to Greg for uh, his discussion of about 15 minutes, and uh, we'll spend the remaining time uh, with questions from the audience. Uh, but please don't sit uh, on your questions uh, this whole time. Feel free to uh, send them through the chats, and um, I'll make sure that uh, we, we come back to it um, at the end. And of course, uh, you will, you're also more, more than welcome to, to speak up during the Q&A. Um, and on top of that, after the, the five o'clock mark, uh, Stockholm time, uh, we still uh, stay on for, for a bit longer for a more informal chat. So now without further ado, uh, Russell, please, the screen is yours for 30 minutes. Okay, well, thank you, Michael. Um, uh, well, uh, very good. So um, this is joint work with Dan Bradley, who uh, I believe is in attendance. I saw his name earlier uh, at South Florida and um, Jan Hanasek and Zaisheng Zhao, who are uh, PhD students at South Florida. And so this is a paper about social investing. And so investing has really always had a social element, um, right? Going back to the 1980s, uh, there was a survey paper by Schiller and Pound. And uh, what they found is the number one determinant of your investment choices was discussions with families and friends. Um, so it's kind of changed over the past 30 years is really the technology uh, that results in kind of social sharing. So instead of talking with a few neighbors, you can now get on a chat room and talk with 10 million different users. Um, and there's lots of these uh, different sites. Some of my past work has looked at uh, Estimize and uh, Seeking Alpha. This paper is going to focus on Wall Street Bets, which is uh, the fastest growing social finance site uh, and has obviously generated a lot of attention recently. Um, with the kind of GameStop event and AMC and, and other uh, phenomena. Uh, one other thing that has changed over the past 30 years is how easy it is to trade as well. And so in the 80s, you probably call up a broker, uh, might have to wait a little bit, pay a $100 commission. Now you can get on your Robinhood app, trade immediately, uh, and it's much more fun. And so you can kind of combine this increasing role of, of social media with this increased ease of trading and you can see that this really has potentially large implications for financial markets. And that's, you know, of course, what we saw in, in January with GameStop. Um, so we think that focusing on, you know, Wall Street bets is, is warranted for a few reasons. Uh, in addition to its tremendous growth, it's also very different from a lot of other social finance sites like Seeking Alpha. Um, it's a much more focused on risk seeking and speculative strategies, uh, which you know, has potentially larger implications for asset prices. There's much less control by moderators. Uh, and there's also increasingly much more emphasis on coordinating. Let's buy and hold together. Let's focus on short squeeze strategies. Um, and that also has potentially large implications for, for asset prices. Just to uh, give you a sense of the growth of Wall Street bets, it, it's been around since 2012, but it really hasn't um, become well known until the past year or so. 
Uh, it had about 1 million to 2 million users throughout 2020. Then the GameStop event occurred and the number of users shot up from about 2 million to over 10 million. Uh, and it has uh, increased since, although probably in terms of active users, it peaked around uh, quarter one of 2021. Hey, and so, you know, all of these things create some regulatory concerns. So it's a huge user base. They tend to take very risky positions, often in illiquid stocks. They have concentrated positions. Um, and so that can create price pressure. There's also a concern about market manipulation, uh, with the idea of being now that there are so many users on the site, it becomes an easy place for kind of bad actors to go and try to do pump and dump type schemes. Hey, and these concerns are kind of frequently uh, discussed in the SEC. So the current chairman has mentioned that you know, the new technologies and particularly the growth of, of social media has really raised concerns about destabilizing prices. And, you know, of course, you know, we know that that can happen. We've seen it with GameStop. And so this, this just plots the price of GameStop, which hovered from between five and $10 for two years and then went up to 350 uh, for no real reason. Um, and it has uh, since stayed pretty high. Uh, it's, it's trading at about $180 today. The other concern that regulators have is how this affects smaller investors. So um, the concern that retail investors are going to listen to the site blindly, they're not gonna recognize that a lot of this advice is bad, uh, and they're going to incur significant trading losses. Uh, in fact, uh, the Secretary of, of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, William Gavin, proposed trading halts in certain popular stocks, including GameStop, with the motivation being, you know, small investors are gonna rush in, they're gonna lose all their money, we have to kind of protect them from themselves. And so, you know, what we're doing in this paper is kind of empirically exploring how significant are these concerns largely? So, you know, does Wall Street bets on average destabilize prices, or is it actually something that is useful for many investors? And has this relation changed uh, over time? And we're gonna focus particularly on pre and post the GameStop event, because that really resulted in a very different uh, user base, right? From roughly 1 million users to 10 million users. And then we're also going to look at, you know, has the site, how does the site affect retail investor trading? Does retail trading become more or less informative? Uh, and does that vary by investor sophistication level? So to summarize our findings, uh, what we find is that before the GameStop event, so starting in around July of 2018 through December, 2020, Wall Street Bet research was informative. And so if you looked at their by recommendations, it positively forecasted future stock returns for a one week or one month holding period. And it also seemed to forecast fundamentals. So it forecasted earnings surprises, sell side analyst earnings forecast revisions and media sentiment. All of these patterns go away after the GameStop event. Uh, and in some cases, you know, with fundamentals, it actually becomes slightly negative. Um, We've dug into you know, what's driving this a little bit. And one of the things we find is that in the um, post GameStop period, there's an increasing emphasis on price pressure and short squeezes um, relative to economic fundamentals. Uh, and those types of reports seem to be particularly uninformative. <clears throat> we also look at how it affects different types of investors' trainings. So we look at institutional investors, we look at large retail traders, which is basically retail trading volume, and small retail traders, which is the number of, of retail trades. We find that institutional investors don't really react to these reports. Uh, large retail investors do react to the reports, uh, but not nearly as strongly as small retail investors. We also find that large retail investors seem more skilled at discerning report quality. So for instance, large retail investors stop following the reports in the post GME period, whereas small investors uh, continue to follow the reports. 
overall, we find that there's little evidence that it's harming retail investors and actually some evidence that they may uh, benefit from these reports. So kind of turning to the data, what we do is we scrape all due diligence reports from Wall Street Bets. And Wall Street Bets has lots of different um, reports, um, you know, YOLOs and things about daily discussions. We're focusing on due diligence, which is uh, more like a Seeking Alpha report, um, more in depth, and it clearly recommends like a buy or sell recommendation. We also collect all of the comments that are in response to the, port, the report. And we have a, a dictionary that we create that looks at whether the comments largely agree with the report or disagree with the report to see if that has any incremental explanatory power. And we split the sample into the pre and post GME period. <coughs> um, just just um, to see how we define comment agreement, we have to use our own data dictionary. Now, using a traditional finance dictionary would not work on Wall Street Bets because they have so much slang and sarcasm. Um, and so, you know, we define bullish words as things like calls are gonna print, uh, meaning you know, call options are gonna make a lot of money. Uh, bearish word would be like puts are gonna print. Um, and so if it's a long recommendation and the bullish words exceeds the bearish words, we define that as having high comment agreement. So just some summary stats, we are um, able to collect 5,050 due diligence posts. These are all on common stocks. Um, about half are in the pre-GME period, half in the post-GME period. Overwhelmingly, the posts tend to be long or buy recommendations. Uh, they generate a fair amount of comments uh, and about half of the time comments are in agreement. We also look at you know, whether the posts are confounded by other major information events like earnings reports, sell side analyst revisions, major news stories, and, and some are, but we find that our results are pretty similar if you exclude those. Uh, throughout the paper, we'll also report the results separately uh, for a sample that excludes GME and AMC. These become really popular in the post GME period. And we can see these types of reports do generate a lot more activity, a lot more comments. <clears throat> so here we just start by looking at you know, what drives Wall Street Bet reports, what are the characteristics of the stocks they cover, and we estimate this for the full sample, and then we also allow the loadings to vary uh, in the post-GME period. Kind of consistent with Wall Street Bet's reputation for liking risky and speculative stocks, we see they tend to gravitate towards volatile stocks, stocks with high short interest, younger stocks, or stocks that just had a lease in IPO. And all of these effects are really amplified in the post GME period. Now, so, for instance, vol the preference for volatility more than doubles in the more recent sample period. <coughs> We turn to our kind of main return prediction regression. And so we regress future one week or one month ahead returns on the number of reports recommending a buy recommendation, less the number of reports recommending a sell recommendation. And we allow that estimate to vary uh, in the post GME period by interacting it with the 2021 dummy. And we uh, include time fixed effects and we control for some firm characteristics. Uh, and we estimate the results for the full sample and excluding GME and AMC. All right, so here are the coefficients on net DD, that gives you the estimate for the pre-GME period. And so what we see for the full sample, or if you exclude GME and AMC, is that these reports are pretty informative. And so for instance, specification one says that one incremental buy recommendation is associated with 86 basis points higher one week ahead returns or 6% higher one month ahead returns. That's a really large number. A lot of that is, is the GME effect that if you exclude GME and AMC, it, it falls to 2.32%, but again, very large. When we look at what happens after the GME event, we see, uh, especially for the one month horizon, 
uh, that the reports are not as informative, right? The estimates are negative and significant. So all of the benefits that we were finding are essentially eliminated. If we, if we sum the coefficients, that gives us the estimate for 2021, and that estimate is insignificant. So they're not bad, they just have stopped becoming informative. Uh, if you extend the results out to longer horizons, you kind of see a pretty similar pattern. Um, essentially, in the, in the pre-period, in the pre-GME period, it was informative, and there was a bit of a drift. Uh, and in the post-GME period, it, it goes away. <coughs> we can also estimate the results quarter by quarter. Um, and what we see is, um, you know, if you say exclude GME and AMC, every quarter in 2020, the reports were useful. There wasn't very much pre-2020, but there was also a fairly small sample of reports. Um, but that immediately goes away uh, in both Q1 and Q2 uh, of 2021. You know, another uh, kind of nice feature of, of social media is you don't just get to see the reports, but you also get to see what users think. Uh, there's some evidence, at least from Seeking Alpha, that this can be incrementally useful. So we look at whether that also uh, is valuable here. And we uh, look at this three ways. First, we estimate it for the full time series. Um, and then we estimate it separately for the pre and post GME period. And the full time series allows us to get a sense for whether comment agreement was perhaps declining in the post GME period, uh, which would also be consistent with skill. And so what we see uh, for the full uh, time series, so that's specifications one or four, when commenters agree with the report, uh, the returns are higher than when they disagree with the report. Right? So for instance, specification four, the uh, one month ahead returns are about 3% higher when commenters are great. Um, some of this is because they had skill in the pre-GME period, and they're about 1.4% higher. Some of this is because comment agreement was just generally higher pre-GME. Um, and then there's no evidence that they had any skill in the post-GME period. So this kind of parallels what we found for contributors and it's consistent with Wall Street bets attracting lots of new users uh, who probably were less skilled than, than the existing user base. So, you know, one question is, um, what is the source of this returns? One view is that this is just price pressure, right? We tend to think of the GME and the AMC and the meme stocks as, as just a price pressure story. An alternative view is that for at least most stocks, they have some information about fundamentals. And so if it's information about fundamentals, you would expect them to be able to predict things like earnings surprises or forecast revisions or possibly even media tone. And so here we just change our dependent variable from future returns to these three measures of cash flow news, media sentiments, earnings surprises, and forecast revisions. And we find a uh, very similar pattern. This is, in, this is for the full sample. If you exclude GME and AMC, you get pretty similar results. But in the pre-GME period, DD Post forecast media sentiments, they forecast earnings surprises and forecast revisions. That completely goes away in the post-GME period. Uh, and in some cases, the actual, the estimates in the post-GME period are even negative. Um, so this is one setting where we do find some evidence of maybe kind of negative market consequences. <clears throat> so kind of what drives this, this change after GME? Clearly the user base has shifted a lot, um, but another potential mechanism is that the content of the report has shifted. Um, and there's a lot of anecdotal evidence that following the success of the GME short squeeze, people shifted their reports towards focusing on price pressure, focusing on short squeezes and kind of sticking it to hedge funds. And so we try to kind of quantify that. So we come up with a list of words that measure whether the report is focused on fundamentals. So these would be things like earnings, revenue, sales, cash flow growth, or if they're focused more on price pressure and short squeezes. So things like short interest, gamma, squeeze, bloat, hedge funds. 
And we define a report as, as price pressure if the number of price pressure words exceed the number of fundamental words. And so not surprisingly, um, these things, these price pressure reports really pick up in the post-GME period. So pre-GME, there was never more than 10% of reports that were focused on price pressure based on our measure. After GME, uh, the estimates are greater than 30%, so more than triples. Um, and these differences are, are highly significant. So then we look at, well, does this, does this matter for performance? You know, are there differences in the informativeness of price pressure versus non-price pressure posts? Uh, and what we find, um, right, if you look at the um, coefficients at the bottom here, so net DD non-PP minus PP, right, that's the difference in the informativeness of non-price pressure versus price pressure posts in the pre-GME period. And there really wasn't very much difference. So they were essentially equally informative. So if you wrote a price pressure post before GMA, there's maybe some good reason to do so. After GMA, when there's this influx of, of price pressure posts, we see that the non-price pressure posts are much more informative. Uh, and in fact, the decline in informativeness is, is much larger uh, for these price pressure posts. So that suggests that you know, users kind of focusing so much on short squeezes is one factor that's resulting in the decline in performance. <clears throat> so our last set of tests gets at you know, this question of how is this affecting uh, investors, particularly smaller investors. And so we're going to look at how different how investors of differing sophistication levels trade following the release of these due diligence reports. So all of this is going to come from TAC. So for institutional investors, we're just going to sign using the uh, Lee and Reddy algorithm. For retail investors, we're going to use the Bomer, Jones, Zhang, and Zhang uh, recent approach. Um, and we're going to kind of focus both on uh, retail trading volume, which largely focuses on larger retail traders, and um, <coughs> retail trading numbers, which is going to focus on smaller retail investors. So you can think of large retail traders as probably wealthy individuals, and small retail traders as more representative of your like typical Robin Hood investor, and the investor that probably uses Wall Street bets. And so we're going to look at two things. First, we're just going to look at what is the association or what is the relationship between due diligence reports and the direction of retail trading or the order imbalances. <coughs> and then we're going to look at, you know, what is the relationship between retail order imbalances and future returns? So essentially trade informativeness. And so what we see is institutional investors, their order imbalances are uncorrelated with due diligence posts. Uh, large retail investors uh, have some correlation, right? so due diligence post increases their order imbalances by about 1.4% in the pre-GME period, but it's much smaller than what we find for smaller investors, where the increase is about 5%. When we look at what happens post-GME, we also see that large retail investors, uh, that correlation essentially goes away. They no longer react to these DD posts. Small investors don't really change their trading behavior as much. So it's consistent with larger investors kind of recognizing this decline in quality, but smaller investors not recognizing it. <coughs> when we look at informativeness, what we see is in the pre-GME period, both large and small retail investor informativeness increased. And that makes sense because they're both following the reports and the reports were informative. In the post-GME period, small investors no longer benefit. The effect goes to zero. Large investors don't really see much of a change. And so that would be consistent with larger investors uh, maybe being able to identify higher quality from lower quality posts uh, and still, still benefit. Results are pretty similar for, for the full sample. So to kind of sum up, you know, Wall Street Bets has attracted a lot of attention, both from investors and regulators, particularly following this GME event. 
And what this paper is doing is looking at whether this attention is warranted. So from an investor perspective, you know, broadly what we're finding is that Wall Street Bet research used to be informative, but it's now no longer valuable on average. So simply blindly following their recommendations is probably not going to be a profitable strategy going forward. But skilled investors may still be able to benefit if they're able to discern kind of variation in report quality. Um, you know, and so I think identifying factors that might be associated with higher quality reports uh, would be useful. And some of our evidence suggests that avoiding price pressure reports would be uh, particularly helpful for investors. <coughs> From a regulatory perspective, uh, what we're finding is you know, the negative consequences that regulators are so worried about are likely overstated. Uh, Pre-GME, it was probably increasing price efficiency. Post-GME, it's largely irrelevant. So there's no positive or negative benefits. And there's also very little evidence that it's harming retail investors, even in the post-GME period. Um, and so uh, that is it for now. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much, um, Russell. And uh, as we turn over to Greg Eaton for his discussion. Let me just uh, remind everyone in the audience that the chat is open for your questions, so you can pose them there before we hit the Q&A. All right, so Greg, the screen is yours for 15 minutes. Okay, thanks, Mihail. Uh, thanks for inviting me to come and uh, to discuss this, uh, this fun paper. Virtually, it's a lot of fun to read, Russell. Um, let me just jump right in. So, um, yeah, so as, as Russell said, this is a paper that studies the effects of social media and financial markets focusing on, on Wall Street bets. It was a lot of fun to read. Uh, the paper, I thought the analysis was well executed. So I, I have some empirical uh, some comments in the empirical analysis that I'll get to, but a fair chunk of my discussion today is going to be on more uh, more big picture stuff. So this is, of course, an important topic. Uh, social media is becoming increasingly influential in, in pretty much all aspects of our lives, and financial markets are, are no exception. So it's something that's that's worthwhile to, to study. There, there are some existing papers on the effects of social media on financial markets, so the evidence is, is mixed. Uh, some evidence suggests that the social media content uh, is informative, while, while other papers find that it detracts from, from price discovery. And uh, there's not a whole lot of existing research on Wall Street bets, though this literature is, of course, quickly uh, developing. Um, and as Russell pointed out, there's reason to believe that the Wall Street bets is different from some of the previously studied social media platforms like Seeking Alpha. So I agree with, uh, with Russell and his co-authors that this is uh, an area that, that's uh, worthwhile to study. So, uh, so, you know, so what do we learn from this paper? So there's evidence that these due diligence posts on Wall Street bets are informative for the first couple of years of their sample, 2018 through 2020, but not during the, the first half of 2021. So uh, as I was reading this paper, I was wondering a little bit about the implications of these findings. So for example, what should policymakers or regulators do with these results. And Russell got to that a little bit at the end. And he also, they also added some, uh, some price pressure analysis, which, which helps some. But let, let me elaborate on this a little bit. So because this is a, a fairly short sample period and we see a, a shift in results, it can be a little bit tricky to, to form, you know, what are the takeaways? Um, you know, for example, because of the short sample period, was the investment analysis on Wall Street bets ever truly informative? I think the authors um, have some reasonable explanations for this part. Um, you know, talking about how there does seem to be a structural shift in the 
Wall Street bet user base. And then they added some nice new uh, results in their slides today that, that look at the price pressure um, effects, which, which helps. On the other hand, uh, again, since we have a short sample period and, and the 2021 results are still are still you know just pretty new, uh, is it possible that investment analysis on Wall Street bets actually is generally informative? And the first part of 2021 was just more of an outlier event. So, for example, maybe those uh, those guys who are going to Wall Street bets and talking about price pressure, maybe those guys die out, and maybe that was more of a blip. So it's it's hard to to know because you know this just happened. Um, so perhaps you know as as you go through the process and have some more time pass. Uh, it could be interesting to see what 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 looks like as you know move into the end of 2021 and perhaps beyond as well. See you know see if the results are still the same as they were for the first half of 2021, or do they revert more than what they were like before? Uh, another point here is uh, so this paper focuses on the due diligence post. There's about 5,000 of those. Now those represent a fairly small fraction. Of Wall Street best Wall Street bets post overall. So when we're you know making conclusions about you know how did the Wall Street bets impact financial markets, I I think it's helpful to think about Wall Street bets as a whole and not just these these sort of special due diligence posts. So you know I don't know if you necessarily have to do analysis for the other post, but you know it might be at a minimum helpful to sort of hash out the other studies a little bit more in that last paragraph of your introduction, sort of, you know, where this fits in to the broader analysis of, of Wall Street bets. That, that might help us, um, you know, form some takeaways on, on what, uh, of what are the effects of Wall Street bets overall on, um, on, on the financial markets. And of course, the due diligence are an important piece of that. Uh, okay, so I, I have some, a uh, few, few comments here on the, on the empirics, this is perhaps uh, my, my main one. So this is one of their, their main results. It's, it's table three. It's regressing future returns on the, the, the due diligence, uh, you know, buy versus sell sentiment. And then there's some controls underneath it. The, the, the left columns are the full sample. The right columns excludes AMC and GameStop. But what I'm specifically interested in are uh, these these return these past return uh, loadings? So the return on day zero, which is the day the due diligence report was issued, and then the returns from the previous week. You see a a pretty big negative loading, especially on day zero, and that so so that suggests that you know there is a negative return leading up to the the, the positive future return following the reports, and that led me to. I have a, a few questions. You know, is there some confounding event that happened at day zero that's causing these negative returns? Now, the authors are pretty careful in trying to do that. They, they look at earnings announcements, some other things. Is there something else? You know, this is hard to completely control for, of course, but is there something else that's calling, causing these negative returns? Um, it, just wondering more broadly, why do these due diligence posts coincide with negative contemporaneous returns, were they a, uh, a function of those returns, or is it is it just happened to occur at, at the same time? Um, is there also some sort of price pressure story here? Maybe there is the big negative return at day zero, and some of this positive return that we're observing in the future is the is the reversal of, of the price pressure of the negative returns at day zero. Um, just something that caught my attention. Um, some other comments that I have. So this first one is more like a, a market efficiency implication. So, you know, if the due diligence posts do contain information, at least in the, the pre-2021 period, uh, why don't the prices adjust more quickly? You know, of course, if we think markets are really efficient, we would expect that uh, the information would be impounded um, on day zero. Um, so I was just a little bit curious of, of, of if, if they are informative, why it you know, took a, at least a few days, if not longer, for, uh, for the prices to 
incorporate that. And, and that also had me curious about, uh, you know, the day zero returns again, kind of what we were looking at before. And specifically, what about after the Wall Street Fed post? Is, is there some sort of reaction that begins to occur after the Wall Street Fed's post? Um, this also had me thinking about the, the, the 2021 results where the, the, the return predictability goes away. Um, this might be a, a long shot, but you know, one alternative hypothesis is that if, if market participants do catch on to these and maybe they react faster, is it possible that some of the positive reaction occurred at day zero after the post? I, again, I don't know if that'd be my prior, but it, it's not necessarily impossible that, that could happen. Um, okay, a few other comments here. Uh, one thing here, the second bullet point, I was wondering, like if if there's a due diligence post that occurs on day zero, and then there's another one for the same stock that occurs a couple of days later, so within the, the future return window, if that could have impacted your results in any way, just maybe just something to, to double check. A uh, couple other comments. I found myself curious uh, how many unique posters are there for the due diligence reports? Is is it you know, just a few guys posting all these or, or is it pretty widespread? I thought that might have been something interesting to point out in the summary stats table. Uh, and then just one final small uh, comment. Uh, the, there's a footnote 11 that says that there's missing due diligence posts between April and July 2020. Uh, there was a, a, a figure three that has some analysis broken up by quarter and there were results for quarter two of 2020. So I was just a little bit, I was just wondering how that uh, could happen if the data were missing uh, during that time period. Maybe, maybe it was just a little bit before and after, but maybe just something to, to clarify. But uh, anyway, that that's all I have, uh, Russell. Um, again, it was, it was a fun paper to read, I enjoyed it. All right, thank you very much, Greg, for the discussion. And uh, Russell, would you like to respond for a couple of minutes? Yeah, sure. Yeah, thank you. Uh, very helpful discussion. Um, some of the things you mentioned we were certainly thinking about. Um, I'll, I'll go through a few of the points. So yeah, implications for policymakers. Um, you know, some of this depends probably on your political views and how like libertarian you are. Um, you know, my own priors are kind of regardless of, of what we find. I'm not sure there's really implications for policymakers. Um, but, you know, to the extent that regulators are concerned about the adverse consequences, uh, I think it's good to have a sense for what those magnitudes are. And so for whatever regulations they are considering, um, you know, say they were thinking about banning Wall Street bets or banning social finance, which you know, of course, they're not. You know, our results would say, you know, let's let's caution on that because the overall kind of negative effects do not appear to be all that strong. Um, I um, I fully agree with uh, the point about um, being more careful with how we write about Wall Street bet consequences. You're right; we're looking at a subset of, of reports, due diligence reports. Uh, which is a relatively small fraction of total reports, I think, or total posts on the site. I think it's maybe around 10%. Uh, so we should we should definitely add that that caveat. Um, we have looked at um, users. One thing that surprised me a little bit is repeat user posts are actually pretty infrequent. Um, so those 5,050 uh, due diligence posts are actually written by like 3,800 users. So the average user only has about 1.3 posts. Um, that surprised me a little bit. I've talked with um, one of the, the students on the paper, Jan, who uses the site a lot. And one of his conjectures is it's actually really easy to get like banned from Wall Street bets for not following the rules, at least temporarily. And so a lot of times what people will do is just sign up with a different username. Uh, and so we may be seeing repeat posts that we can't track. Um, so that might be some of it. I don't think it's a, it's a full explanation on that. On um, the return zeros, one thing to note is uh, that's, that's a full panel regression. So it's not just conditional on uh, a DD report. 
So it doesn't necessarily mean um, that that we're not like interacting with turn zero with the DD report. So I think all that's really saying is for whatever reason, over the recent sample period, there was negative serial correlation in returns over short horizons. So if you had very positive returns today, next week, you tend to have lower returns. Um, I mean, I know that's been found you know, in the asset pricing literature before. The magnitudes do seem large, but I guess it's probably just an artifact of our short time series. Um, the, the time series stuff, you're right. It, it's hard. Uh, it is hard to pin down exactly what's going on when you have only two years of data. Um, why we say Wall Street bets had a shock and they became less informative in 2021. Uh, a, a more skeptical view is, wow, they just got really lucky in 2020, and now everything's kind of reverting back to normal. Um, I think hopefully the price pressure stuff that we've done is at least you know, providing some mechanism for what might be going on. Um, but I, uh, I agree that it's going to be tough to get really sharp causal inference with, with our time series. Uh, but overall, a lot of really good, good comments that will be very helpful for us in our revision. All right, perfect. Uh, so um, no, let me just uh, still officially thank them, Russell and, and Greg for contributing to, to this series. Uh, it, was, it was great to, um, to have you here. And uh, to everyone else, thank you for attending and, uh, and see you next time.